Hello, my name's Kate Chesterman. I'm a GP in South Norfolk and I also co-host the GP Notebook Education Study Groups. On this video today, I'm going to be thinking about the limping child. And the first thing I'd like us to do is to consider a case study. So this is the case of Jim. Jim is seven years old and he had a viral upper respiratory tract infection about a week ago. This morning he got up and came downstairs complaining of pain in his right leg and his dad noticed that he was limping. His dad was understandably concerned about this and brought him along to see you. Examining Jim, his vital signs were all within the normal ranges, but you noticed that he had an antalgic gait, so a painful limp, but a normal range of movement in all joints. So what diagnoses would you want to consider in Jim? Do you think he may have transient synovitis or a septic arthritis? Could this be a slipped upper femoral epiphysis or Perthes disease? Or at this stage, are you considering all of these diagnoses? Well, there are quite a lot of differentials to consider, aren't there, when thinking about the limping child? And we'll have a think about how to break them down into a bit more of a manageable list shortly. But my two main resources for this topic um, were a very good article in the British Journal of General Practice from just last year on the limping child, when to worry and when to refer. And there is also a very helpful, nice clinical knowledge summary um, on the same topics on acute childhood limps that was also updated in 2020. So some really up to date and helpful resources for us. And one of the really helpful things that these resources both did was to separate the list of possible differentials into age groups. And I did find this quite a helpful way of bringing down that quite big list of differentials, as we've said, into a more manageable groups. So there are quite a few conditions that can happen at any age. So trauma and soft tissue injury can happen in, in infants, children, young people at any age. And we always need to be aware, don't we, of the possibility of non-accidental injury and keeping that as a possibility until we're happy that that hasn't occurred. Infections can also happen at any age as well. So septic arthritis, osteomyelitis, cellulitis may all cause children to limp um, and are worth being aware of. And then there are thankfully some, some rarer conditions, so neoplasms, neuromuscular conditions, maybe muscular dystrophy. Hematological disease such as sickle cell can cause joint pain. Metabolic disease, we know that rickets is on the rise. Discitis, and also be aware of non-musculoskeletal presentations as well. So intra-abdominal pathology or inguinoscrotal pathology may also cause a child to limp. And then in our young age group, so under the age of three, differentials to be aware of are things such as septic hip. Now I've included this again in the under, age, in the under three age group as well as in the any age group because it is an important differential at this age and much more common than transient synovitis in this young age group. So one always to be aware of. And children at this age can also present with toddler's fractures or developmental dysplasia of the hip. In our middle age group, so between about three and 10, and, and this is the age group that Jim will fall into, other things to be aware of are conditions such as transient synovitis, and also Perthes disease. Now, Perthes disease is an idiopathic avascular necrosis of the developing femoral head. It's slightly more common in boys than girls and usually has quite an insidious onset over weeks. These children usually have limited hip rotation and the pain can be referred to their groin, thigh or knee. It's bilateral in about 10% of cases but the children are usually systemically well with it. And then in the older age group, other considerations might be a slipped upper femoral epiphysis, and we'll talk a little bit more about this condition later on. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis may also present at this age. And also thinking about the possibility of osteochondritis desiccans, which is where a small piece of subchondral bone begins to separate from its surrounding area due to a disturbance in the blood supply. 
This can lead to joint pain and may hinder movement within that joint. And it's a common cause of loose body within the joint space. It's a quite common cause of knee pain um, in children between the ages of about 10 and 19. And the other condition to think about in this age group is Oscar Schlatter's disease. And this is an overuse injury that's caused by multiple small avulsion fractures around the tibial tuberosity. And this is usually a self-limiting disorder, but it causes anterior knee pain during adolescence and again may cause children to limp. So apart from age, other key things to think about when we're taking our history and examining the child are the duration and progression of the limp and also any associated pain. But just remember that young children may not be able to localise or verbalise their pain effectively. It's also helpful to be aware of any family history and also any developmental concerns as well. So have they reached their milestones on time? And are there any risk factors for developmental dysplasia of the hip? And when thinking about developmental dysplasia of the hip, I like to think of the five Fs. So developmental dysplasia of the hip is more common in females who are first born, who were feet down or breech in utero, where there's a family history, and also where there's been a lack of fluid in utero or oligohydramnios. A few other really important considerations, again, when we're taking our history, is is there any history or even the possibility of a history of trauma? And again, always being alert to the possibility of non-accidental injury. And also, is the child unwell? As we'll see a little bit later on, there's a big difference between a well child with a limp and an unwell child with a limp. It's a really important differentiation to make. And also check that the child is weight bearing. Have a look at their gait. If they've got an antalgic gait, so a painful limp, that usually implies an acute problem where other gaits usually imply chronic problems. Other signs of chronicity may be leg length asymmetry, spine deformities or calf hypertrophy. So worth looking out for them as well. And we want to feel and move the joints. Now, NICE suggests that it can be quite helpful to undertake a PGALS assessment. Now, you may be aware of the GALS assessment, the gait, arms, legs, spine, as a screening examination for rheumatological or musculoskeletal problems in adults. And the PGALS assessment is the paediatric version of this. Now, I have to admit, when I first looked at this, I thought that's not something that's really feasible in a 10 minute GP consultation. But I had a child come in recently with a joint problem and I thought it was a good, good opportunity to give this a go. And actually with a compliant and helpful child, you can run through these movements in about two to three minutes. And I did find it very helpful in reassuring me there were no other problems with her joints. Um, so it'd probably be worth giving this a go and maybe trying it out next time you have a child coming in with a musculoskeletal or rheumatological problem. I have put a link on the slide at the end of this talk um, to a video um, and that video is about six minutes long and it shows somebody going through this PGALS assessment. Um, so if you have six minutes to spare, maybe worth having a look at that. I found it very helpful. Now, the other thing that we need to do again when thinking about children with limps is to make sure there are no red flags. And I don't think there are many on this list that would come as a surprise to most of you or would not raise an appropriate level of concern. So I think we'd all be concerned, wouldn't we, if a child presented with night pain, redness or stiffness of the joint, if they were systemically unwell with anorexia, weight loss, fever, or if they had unexplained rashes or bruising. I think we'd be worried with ch children with severe pain, anxiety and agitation, particularly after an injury or if they were unable to weight bear or had a palpable mass. The one I really want to highlight is the bottom row of this table, which is looking for the possibility of slipped upper femoral epiphysis. And I think this is really important to look out for. And interestingly, don't always seem to appear on lists of red flags. But children with this condition may have outtoeing or shortening of the affected limb. 
and we're going to go on on the next slide to talk a little bit more about slipped up ephemeral epiphysis and why it's important not to miss it. So first of all, what is it? Well, slipped up ephemeral epiphysis is displacement of the proximal femoral epiphysis from the metaphysis. It's slightly more common in boys than girls, and it's more common in children who are overweight. There are some other rare associations with slipped up ephemeral epiphysis as well, including hypothyroidism, treatment for growth hormone deficiency, and a history of radiotherapy treatment. And it can have either an acute or insidious onset. And again, children get pain sometimes within the hip, but it may also be referred to the groin, thigh, or knee. And when you examine them, you may notice that they have an antalgic gait, so again, a painful limp, out-toeing, shortening of the affected limb, and limited internal rotation. And the reason that this is an important diagnosis, and one that I think should appear on lists of red flags, is because prompt diagnosis is crucial to avoid further displacement and the risk of avascular necrosis. So any child who you're concerned may have a slipped up ephemeral epiphysis needs referring that same day and to be seen by orthopaedics on the same day. Now the other problem I think we're sometimes faced with, aren't we, in primary care, is to decide whether something's a septic arthritis or a transient synovitis. So septic arthritis, which is an inf which is an infection of the synovium and joint space, is an orthopaedic emergency. And this is because it can lead to joint destruction in as little as 24 to 48 hours. Whereas transient synovitis is a self-limiting condition, usually lasts about three to 10 days, and it's an inflammation rather than an infection of the synovium. It's thought to be triggered by a viral illness, though it's worth pointing out that not all children will give a history of a viral illness. And even if they don't, they can still have transient synovitis. But the problem is, is that septic arthritis and transient synovitis can both present with similar signs and symptoms. So how do we differentiate between the two? Well, there is a common scoring system that's been used to quantify the risk of septic arthritis, and this is known as Cocker's Criteria, which he published in his paper back in 1999. So it's quite old now, but it stood the test of time. And the idea of this is that the higher the score using the four risk factors, the likelier it is to be septic arthritis. And the four risk factors are non-weight bearing on the affected side, an ESR over 40, a temperature above 38.5, or a white cell count over 12. Now I'm sure you can all probably appreciate the problems of applying this criteria in primary care in that we don't have immediate access to blood results. So by the time I get a blood result back 20, 24 hours later, if it turns out they have an ESR over 40 or a white cell count over 12, and this is septic arthritis, well, we're already 24 hours down the line and there may already be joint destruction. But if we look just at the criteria that we do have available to us in primary care, so non-weight bearing on the affected side and a temperature over 38.5, well, if both of those criteria are present, there's a 40% chance that this is septic arthritis that child needs a same day admission and assessment. And actually, even if only one of those criteria are present, if they've got a temperature of over 38.5 or they can't weight bear, there's still a 3% chance that this is a septic arthritis, which given the severity of the, the condition and the consequences of a delayed diagnosis would still justify an urgent same day assessment by secondary care. So building on from that, NICE suggests that we should be doing urgent same-day referrals for all children under the age of three with an acute onset of limp. And this goes back to that table we were looking at right at the beginning of this talk, when we said, didn't we, that septic arthritis is much more common than transient synovitis in this age group. So all children under the age of three get referred if they have an acute onset of limp. We should also be referring all children over the age of nine with painful or restricted hip movements, particularly if it's internal rotation that's affected, 
and this is to exclude a slipped upper femoral epiphysis. And obviously younger children with risk factors would also need referring to rule out this condition. We should also be doing urgent same day referrals for any child who is unable to wait there, is pyrexial or has red flag symptoms suggesting a serious pathology. Also for any children who are in severe pain, agitated or have reduced peripheral pulses or muscle weakness that may indicate neurovascular compromise or impending compartment syndrome. And finally, we should be doing urgent same day referrals if there is any suspicion of maltreatment or non-accidental injury. Now, in addition, we should be considering referrals and here the urgency really depends on your clinical situation and your judgment. But if there is uncertainty about the cause, if you know what the cause is, but it can't be managed in primary care, or if a child presents with a limp on multiple occasions. But NICE are happy that we can be managing children in primary care if they're between the ages of three and nine, if they're well, afebrile, mobile but limping, so able to wait there, and if they have a short duration of symptoms. So if those symptoms have been present for less than 72 hours, or if they've been present slightly longer, so over 72 hours, but they're already starting to improve. And this is because in these children, the likely diagnosis is transient synovitis. These children can be treated with rest and simple analgesia, but with good safety netting. So advise them to go to A&E if the symptoms worsen, the child develops a fever or becomes unwell. We should be arranging to follow these children up quite quickly to make sure that their symptoms are starting to improve. And then again, a week after the onset of symptoms to make sure that they've completely resolved. And if they haven't completely resolved or if there's doubt about the diagnosis, again, we would want to be considering a referral. And again, the urgency of this would depend on your clinical judgment. NICE are also happy that we can manage soft tissue injuries in primary care, so sprains or strains. And then finally, they also suggest that if there is a history of trauma or focal bony tenderness, but no indication for referral, then these can be managed initially in primary care. And I think what NICE is suggesting here is that if you have access to same day x-ray, then you could do this in the first instance, but then refer that child on, even if the x-ray is normal, but they have a persistent limp. Now, I don't have access to same day x-ray other than by admitting the child either to A&E or secondary care. So this one's not really relevant for me. And so I feel if I had a child who had trauma or focal bony tenderness, I would be wanting to get them seen immediately. So that brings me to the end of the talk today. Again, I've put the references for this talk on this final slide, um, and I've also included what I hope will be a couple of useful resources for you. So there's that six minute video of the PGALS assessment. And also I just wanted to highlight a blog that's written by a gentleman called Dr. Edward Snelson. He writes um, really very good and very helpful blogs. Um, he used to be a GP, but has retrained as a, a paediatric emergency physician, but he has a very good understanding of, of what we do and what we try and achieve in primary care. And his blogs always have some very helpful tips and tricks. Um, there is one on the limping child, but also others um, on rashes or um, presentations in newborn infants. So if you have a minute, again, well worth taking a look at his blogs. Thank you for listening.